Cave Story has masterful game design. Masterful is not a word I throw around often, but Cave Story's game design certainly deserves it. If you've never played Cave Story before, then spoilers! But I'm making an educated guess that you have. If you've heard of the concept of flow, then good, because we're going to make extensive use out of it right now to show how this game adheres so strictly to flow theory that it just boggles my mind. So how could just one guy have made such a well-designed and enjoyable game? Well, let's get to it! Part 1. The Safe Room Policy You know when you wake up and you're still sort of groggy because it's nice and quiet and you're just so relaxed? Well, what if every morning you were awoken by the sweet, dulcet tones of... <laughs> It would be disorienting, and you'd be kinda mad. Same rule applies to video games, in what is known as the safe room policy. When you're first starting a game, you're kinda disoriented, because you don't really know the controls, the mechanics, or the physics. So instead of starting you off in a room full of enemies, Cave Story gives you an entire room to yourself to fool around in. The original Mario Brothers did the same thing with its first enemy, because you're given plenty of time to figure things out before a challenge comes. This little room teaches you almost everything you need to know about the game. You're forced to learn to jump in order to exit, and if you fall trying to get a grasp on the controls, you'll fall into the water, where you'll notice this little air meter. Numbers are scary, so you probably want to get out ASAP, and voila, you're not in danger of drowning. You're also given free access to a save icon and a heart station, which are key parts of the game. When you finally want to leave, you'll have to figure out how to exit by pressing down on the D-pad. So in this tiny little safe room, we already know how to jump, save, refill our life for free, enter and exit areas, and avoid drowning. And all of this is in a threat-free environment. Don't you just feel your confidence growing? We take this safe room policy for granted a lot of the time, but it's pretty easy to understand why it's so important. The first 60 seconds of Resident Evil 2 find you immediately surrounded by zombies. You're watching these zombies come closer while trying to move your character, but oh wait, it's tank controls, so you'll probably just end up spinning around in circles. Oh, we're dead. If you aren't already familiar with Resident Evil controls, you'll probably die in this very first area, because you're given no time to figure things out. But in Cave Story, you already feel like you have a handle on the game and that you can probably take whatever the next room holds for you. This safe room policy does so much to engage the player because it's unrelated to any individual player's skill level. Part 2. Showing Chevron Telling So you finally leave your little room and you're presented with this screen. First you try going right, and you realize that the way is blocked by these funky looking blocks. Luckily, there's one within reach that doesn't require you to fight anything. And you go up to it and mash all the buttons, but nothing. So you're pretty sure you can't get past here yet. So instead of jumping right into this enemy and taking damage trying to get through, you have a practice block a few steps closer to you to teach you that these blocks can't be broken in the player's current state. Already you know this is a dead end, and you didn't have to be told this in a pop-up tutorial or by taking damage and dying. So let's try the other way. You know, it looks pretty scary, but you're pretty sure you remember how to jump, and you clear these spikes with ease. You might want to jump on these bats here like Mario, but if you try, you'll see that you'll take damage. Okay, so you can't damage enemies yet, but now you've got another problem. Your health is low. Well, you get past this first bat, and you'll notice a little capsule here in the wall, which conveniently gives you a good boost to your health. So at this point in the game, all you've learned to do is open doors and jump around the environment, and already you're being rewarded. This makes you feel good, because you're already conquering the game's first challenge, and this inspires you to keep going. Eventually, you'll get the Polar Star, your first weapon. The name doesn't really tell you much, but the icon is a gun, so you're pretty sure you can start killing enemies now. And you notice this fancy little icon up here in the corner, and oh my, level 1. My character is level 1. Great! So you leave the room and you proceed to go back to that block from before, because you remember that you couldn't break it. You'll probably collect these little triangles purely by accident at first, and you'll notice your level bar increasing. You'll also probably refill your life by collecting hearts, but even if you don't, you're still in good shape here. It's at about this point that you'll discover that collecting experience levels up your weapons, not your character. This is, in my opinion, perhaps the crowning achievement of Cave Story's gameplay. Instead of giving your character permanent HP or damage upgrades, your guns are your main form of progression. So what's the big deal? Well, in a Metroidvania title like Castlevania or Metroid, there's no downside to tanking through rooms or even boss fights, especially with potions available. You can put on better armor and grind for HP, and eventually all you'll need to do is hit an enemy faster than they hit you. In contrast, Cave Story punishes you for taking damage not only by taking away your HP, but also by removing power from your guns, meaning that trying to tank through an area is virtually impossible. You're encouraged to be careful and methodical, treating each enemy as a worthy opponent. If you don't, you'll find yourself at the end of an area having to fight a boss with low HP and level 1 weapons. Weapon leveling also gives each area a consistent drop other than hearts and missiles, and forces you to navigate some tricky platforming if you want to collect the experience you've earned. Weapon leveling as a concept is an incredibly effective way to pace the player, and also to encourage them to play the game the way it was meant to be played. If you make it to this door, you'll notice that you have to jump up to it. You might also notice that it has a giant scary red eye. If you for some reason decide to jump up anyway, you'll take 4 damage. And if you took 1 damage earlier from jumping into a bat, this will leave you with 1 HP. But instead of killing you with a cheap death, the game's telling you that its areas are teeming with enemies, 
Not only this, but they do a lot of damage, and that it's going to let you slide this time, but you better be more careful in the future. If this door does kill you, then you only have to replay the first two rooms, and hopefully you learn from your mistakes. Next, we're given two very brief cutscenes that are incredibly important for the player experience. In the first one, we learn that this guy's hungry. Okay, he's trying to reach someone named Sue. In just a few seconds, we learn that this guy is trapped in a room, and he's calling for help. In the next scene, these two rabbit-looking things, called Mimigas, are engaged in conversation about events that are already happening. This means it's up to you to piece together the game's story. So you don't even get to know your character's name, but these guys get whole cutscenes? It feels like there are bigger things going on here. This is one of the game's strongest assets. It inspires curiosity from its very first moments, and humans being naturally curious, we'll play on to find out more about this world. So anyway, you drop from the ceiling and the game starts again. Notice the very first thing that happens here. Quote will always drop down and face right upon standing, which means that the camera will slowly pan towards the right and give you more viewing space on the right side. You might notice the red disc, and if you're lucky, some neurons in your brain will fire and say, oh yeah, this is a save point, let's check it out. It's two simple jumps to get to the room, and inside you'll refill your life and save, so already you feel like you're on top of things here. You're now being shown, rather than told, that there's another safe room just a few steps away. So you might try to talk to this guy, expecting him to tell you where to go or what to do on some sort of fetch quest, but no. All he does is make cryptic remarks about the current position of the game's story, and he leaves you to advance on your own. Of course, when you talk to King, the camera will pan to the left, because that's the way you're facing. And surprise, surprise, there's another door here. Hey, we know how to enter doors, let's do it. You'll have to make slightly trickier jumps here, but your reward is a Mimiga that just happens to know exactly where to find Sue. You might decide to investigate this shiny thing, which turns out to be a locket. Well, can you equip it? Mm, can you use it? Apparently not yet, but we've learned that there are key items in this game that are probably related to the story and not meant purely for character progression. Back outside, you learn this Mimiga has the key to Arthur's house. Wait a second, didn't we just overhear that Sue is in Arthur's house? Well, let's get the key. Notice how this Mimiga runs to the right and down. If we follow suit, we'll see that even though this area is initially daunting because of its size, there's only one possible place she could have gone. Look at what the game is doing here. It's leaving breadcrumbs for you, not in the form of pop-up boxes or tutorials, but simply through the actions of its characters. You don't have any clue what's going on, but with a little attention to detail, you'll always know exactly where to go next. The game is still guiding you, just like it did in the very first area, simply by the design of its levels. Shortly after, you're introduced to what you assume to be the game's main antagonist, and her little crony, this lunchbox Kool-Aid man looking guy. His name is Balrog. He literally asks you if you want to fight him. So now you're probably thinking, ah, oh, this is a boss fight. But if you don't feel comfortable with the game yet, you can always say no, and he'll just go away. But if you say yes, you'll get some valuable practice against this enemy, because he continues to pop up. So no matter which choice you make, it's going to be to your benefit here. Now that Taroko has been kidnapped, you might consider telling the only other NPC you've met in the village so far. So you start climbing these blocks back up to the save point, and oh, look at this little fat guy. He'll conveniently spell out the story for you, just in case that last scene was a little vague. You make your way back up to King, and what? Where did he go? Well, I guess this is your time to explore, but believe it or not, you've already been over most of this map, simply getting the story going on here. If it felt daunting at first, you'll find that you've already got a good grasp on it, not to mention with all the practice with jumping and shooting that you're getting at the same time. And since we've already been to the left here, your next instinct is probably just to go right, where you'll find another building where King waits for you. A careful eye will also spot this golden chest at the bottom of the screen. This is your real first test of the game's jumping, but failing the test doesn't kill you. This punishment is designed to ease you into the game. Notice how this is a blind jump. You can't see the platform, but you can see this weird chain-looking thing. Even if you missed it before, you'll instinctively aim for the chain to discover that these blocks are suspended by chains, so you have a visual cue as to where you have to jump. When you get to this chest, you'll get a map, and you can check it and see the entire area all at once. Whereas this might have been overwhelming five minutes ago, you've been in every single area here already, except for one, which you now have the key for. So you should be able to look at this map and recognize every part of it, simply through progressing the story. Next, you'll wind up in the cemetery, and you'll learn two important things. First, you run into this guy that you can't seem to damage. But if you wait till he prepares to strike you, you'll find that you can damage him, but also that he deals really high damage. So now you know that some enemies can only be attacked in certain situations, and you can't just go blasting off your gun to solve every little problem. You'll also notice this door here, even though you can't get up to it. This might get you thinking that sooner or later, you're probably going to loop back to this area from somewhere else, maybe as a shortcut or something. And you'll keep that in mind as you play, because you already have a list of treasures that you want that door to be hiding. Experience, another heart capsule, or some new treasure. If you're low on health because of this guy, you'll be happy to find out that the cemetery loops around on itself, so you can exit without having to fight anything else. Since you went all this way and got a key item, it's nice to know that you're safe and you won't have to replay this section over. Now that we've got the basics out of the way, we're going to go fast and check out the particularly interesting parts of the game's remaining areas. And we're going to repeatedly notice one very strong theme here, which is high value per area. 
So it's time to put all these skills we've learned to use. Let's look at the very first encounter in the Egg Corridor, the real first area of the game. Part 3. Efficiency in Level Design This behemoth looks intimidating, but you're standing on a ledge out of its range. And if you attack it, it eventually goes berserk and charges. This platform is your mini safe room. Just like before, you get to try out new challenges in a safe environment before facing them head on. Just a few minutes later in the same room, you won't be able to attack from above, and you'll instead have to jump in and fight two behemoths at once. Later on, you'll find a computer terminal telling you to visit egg number 6. These giant eggs at the bottom of the screen that we originally took for background scenery are actually part of the level. This is a step up in challenge. The entrance to the egg is two tiles wide, but on your way out of the egg back up to the upper part of the level, you'll have to jump through a hole that's only a single tile wide. This requires accuracy and speed, because this white speedy guy down here is still active. A carelessly aimed jump can kill you instantly here, but because you just did a jump with a two tile width, you can probably manage this one. You'll also notice that anytime you're required to go backwards through a level, platforms and blocks also function in reverse. What I mean is that to go to the right, you have to go under this set of blocks. But to go to the left, you need to jump up higher and fall through a hole here. These sections of level effectively pull double duty by presenting not one, but two distinct platforming challenges. This is a theme central to the entire game, and it gives the levels incredible value. Despite their relatively small spaces, they're densely packed with platforming challenges that change depending on whether you're heading left or right. The enemy placements also reinforce this idea because they're easier to kill coming from the left, but slightly more challenging coming from the right on the way back. So you'll need to master shooting up and down here as well as you jump between platforms. Your next task is in the bushlands. You'll find the key to Santa's house less than a quarter of the way through the area, and then you have to head back to the entrance. Santa will also give you the fireball, which has a different arc than the polar star, making it useful for going down hills when enemies are hard to shoot at in a straight line. Look how you're encouraged to experiment with this weapon immediately by the presence of many ups and downs in hilly areas. Since this weapon is mandatory, you can't not get it. The level design just afterwards is designed to complement its use, so that the player can learn how it works. Next, you head into Chaco's house, about halfway through the bushlands. She tells you you need some jellyfish juice, which means you need to backtrack again. But wait, you cry, I didn't see any jellyfish! Then you exit her house, and- Surprise, motherfucker! There are new enemies all over the place, and this conspicuously empty platform now has something for you to kill. You can see how much backtracking you do here already, but playing the stage in reverse is a little different than in the forward direction, and now there are jellyfish enemies to contend with, in addition to the original enemies you saw here. You notice that it's hard to hit this jellyfish, sometimes your attacks are blocked. You're also not sure how to go about dodging it, but if you stand directly under it, this magical block will prevent it from coming down on top of you. This is another gradual acclimation to the game's combat, showing you the abilities of the enemies before you need to take them on. If you haven't discovered that you can shoot upwards, by this point your natural instinct is to do exactly that. Instead of telling you outright, this game puts you in a position to help you discover your abilities naturally. About two thirds of the way up, you'll come across a locked door. Just a few steps later, you'll find the big warehouse where this guy has been trapped the whole time. He then gives you the key, so you have to backtrack just a little here to find the robot capable of blowing up a big hole in the warehouse. But first you have to go talk to the trapped guy about this robot. Then you backtrack to the robot again and tell him you want to make a bomb. He'll give you a fetch quest and you have to collect three different items in this area, including some more jellyfish juice, which means backtracking almost to the beginning of the level. But hey look, all these fans are now active. So on top of the jellyfish changing the level, we also have these fans that will help us reach new parts of the area. Once you've got another jar of juice, you have to go back to the very beginning where the only other fireplace in the area is. Notice how we still haven't explored the entire area, but we've already been back and forth multiple times, each time with a new challenge or mechanic for the player to encounter. Depending on the height and the spike pits, both ways present different challenges in tandem. Remember this chart regarding flow? It says that a game's challenge has to remain in line with your abilities, or else we either get frustrated from the difficulty or bored from the simplicity. With a few simple tweaks to certain enemies and mechanics, it becomes harder and harder to stay on task and navigate each section, and all the while the player is experiencing a fresh take on this area each time the quest advances. That value, man! On your search for these items, you'll come by this tower appropriately called the Execution Chamber. If you're wondering why it's called this, try shooting the blocks above you. The name of this room clues you in to maybe just be a little bit careful, if you don't mind. If you solve this mini puzzle on your first try, it feels amazing. If you didn't solve it, you'll probably end up laughing at yourself for dying this way. So either way, it kind of ends up a positive experience. It takes a special game to make getting crushed by blocks a non-frustrating matter. You'll trek all the way to the far right to get the gum, and by this time, the entire area has been fully explored. It sounds tedious because of all the backtracking, but in reality, you can speedrun this area from start to finish in 45 seconds, and the constantly changing enemies and platforms prevent it from ever becoming tedious. 
instead of feeling like just another level you'll finish and never come back to, this level has NPCs, some fetch quests, and changing environments that make it come alive as you play. So finally, you can go save this guy, and surprise, surprise, you have to backtrack all the way to the beginning of the level and leave. The next area is the Sand Zone, my personal favorite, mainly because of the godly music. This area has a ton of sand traps with snapping enemies. Notice how this enemy is hinted at, with the skeletons strewn about their hiding place. Without this clue, there would be no indication which sand pits you can safely step on and which will hurt you. Speaking of taking damage, did you know that in Cave Story most bosses don't hurt you simply by touching you? One of the common uh, tropes of the bosses is that their hitboxes either don't exist or um, they do very little damage. So um, you see me standing inside of Igor right here. That's because the only time she can damage you is when he punches, and that was, that was a good fight. Unlike in most platformers, you and bosses are equal. Neither of you will take damage simply from touching each other. This makes certain boss fights a cakewalk, as you only have to dodge when bosses are in their attack animations. At the same time, it's a nice touch, because so many bosses are so large that you might need to run around them and risk touching them. Anyway, this is where the challenge of the game really shines. If you're a first time player, you probably exchange your Polar Star for Curly's machine gun, and you'll discover that the fully upgraded form lets you hover in the air, bypassing some tough platforming sections. You'll also notice that you can now pass under this entire section, and simply fly up at the end if you're not up for the challenge. On the other hand, if you didn't trade with Curly, you're stuck traversing these platforms the old fashioned way, and falling down means going back to the very beginning. If you play the game through a second time, you might choose to keep the Polar Star, and the game will present a brand new challenge to you accordingly. This theme carries through to the next area, the labyrinth, where you're ascending in a vertical chamber. Got the machine gun? You're covered. If not, it's time to prove your platforming skills. In fact, this entire zone is a cakewalk with the machine gun because of all the platforming puzzles that can be circumvented. Seriously, choosing what to do with the Polar Star or the machine gun is literally the most important choice that you'll make, and its effects will be felt throughout the rest of your playthrough. Keeping the Polar Star will deny you certain points perched up on unreachable ledges, life capsules, and treasures just out of reach, and generally make the platforming much harder. This is also the first area of the game without quick and easy access to a hearts and missiles refiller. Instead, you're given a safe point with a few breakable blocks near Jenka's house. So why isn't there an instant healing box in Jenka's house? Either the game wants you to conserve your health, conserve your missiles, or both. Notice how it gradually increases the challenge by subtly removing crutches. Finally, we're stepping out of the kiddie pool here, and the game is telling you, okay, we'll throw you a bone with these hearts here for now, but don't expect any favors in the future. This is why the game is fair. It tells you all you need to know from the individual pieces of each level. Take this room for instance. You need to collect Jenka's dogs, and one of them is here. If this is your first time playing this game, you're probably confused as to why there's a save point in here. There are a couple ways to tackle this problem. Since you can't see platforms in here, you could just blindly jump around, but the chances are very, very good that you will land on this croc trap that you can't see but you suspect it's there once again because of the skeleton. And if you just saved, then you'll suddenly understand why the save point is here. The game knows you're probably about to die, and it provides an easy restart for you, rather than having you start from your previous save. That would be a sadistic, frustrating, and player unfriendly choice, because let's face it, this death can be cheap. Adding the save point here makes it not only not cheap, but also kind of a humorous event. In fact, the only real way to know how to reach that dog is to use the map, then it becomes trivial. If you forgot up until now that the map even existed, then this is a sharp reminder for you from the game. It'll come in handy once we reach the larger areas, but the game wants to give you a fair fight by prepping you to utilize all the assets you have. This prepping is also being done by these skeleton crocs. See how shooting them with a laser is really wasteful and you'll often end up taking hits and missing? But if you use the fireball here, every shot you fire will land. Psst, don't forget about other weapons. Gee, thanks game. Near the end of the sand zone, you'll have to jump across these pillars with insta-death spikes underneath. You can't see them from up here, but watch what happens when you approach this alcove. Your natural instinct here is to jump in there to get over to the next platform on the right. But if you look carefully, you'll see a sign on the left, right next to a paw print block. The sign tells you that you can pass through certain blocks, and then gives you a block right here to try it out on. This is an incredibly smart way to give key knowledge to the player. The sign is obvious, so any new player will want to fall down to read it. Then they'll notice the block. Then, as they backtrack, they'll notice that there are other paw print blocks throughout the level that they can pass through and discover secret passages. Without this little hint tucked away in the level, trying to justify why the paw print blocks would even exist is pointless, and these blocks would be counterintuitive to the player. That always feels bad, and is certainly bad game design. When you beat Rabbit Taroko, who is this area's boss, there's no victory music. And this is fitting. You just killed one of the game's main characters. Instead of praising you, Cave Story forces you to realize just what you've done, 
and to question whether there was another way. Sadly, there isn't, but the simple lack of a victory cue is enough here to upset your flow and make you think twice about it. Part 4. Yo, check out these moving blocks. Yo, check out these moving blocks. These moving blocks can crush you quite easily, but notice that in this room, there's no actual danger. If you're hit by a block, you'll simply be pushed off and have to climb back up. But then look in the next room. Whoa, it's like the game is teaching you about hazards in a safe environment before it tries to slaughter you. This is what we call giving the player a fair chance to succeed. This happens again a little bit later, when we revisit the first major area, Egg Corridor. This time there are stalactites that fall from the ceiling. Notice how they are bright red in contrast to the rest of the area. Of course, most of them don't fall. So in order to teach the player that this is a new obstacle, it's important to drop the first one in a very safe location. Luckily, we're given the maximum possible height between the player and the stalactite here, and because the nearby enemy goes down quickly, chances are very good that the player's already moved to the right to collect dropped experience or hearts. From here on though, the spikes will fall in really inconvenient areas, so you'll probably take a hit or seven on the way through. Again, it's a cakewalk if you have either the machine gun or the booster, but if not, it's a serious challenge. From here, you'll scale the outer wall, explore the plantation, tile screen music, and eventually make your way through the game's first final dungeon. If you talk to Kazuma and agree to escape with him, the game will actually end there, cutting off a huge chunk of the game, despite your victory. How does it make you feel when you decide to escape on the dragon and leave the rest of the people you've met stranded on this floating continent? If you have a soul, it probably makes you feel horrible, and you'll reload your save and choose the other option to stay. It's here that you might notice the subtle but ever-present sense of tragedy in this game. We've watched innocent Mimigos get turned into monsters, we as the player are forced to kill Toroko, and Curly, the only other robot friend we have, sacrifices her life so that we can survive the fight. But this scene on the outer wall is the first time that such a choice directly affects the direction of the story. It's not all that important, but I thought it was a really brave thing to put in the game, if you get where I'm coming from here. Pixel, the creator, knows that you won't be satisfied with this bad ending, but it's still an option to you, and it goes along with the tragic tone of the game. It's the easiest way to the end credits, for sure, but it's also the least rewarding way, and it makes you feel bad, man. Real bad. So reload your save and try again. This is yet another example of the variable difficulty the game offers, independent of any sort of difficulty select screen. There's a true bit of genius here with the final dungeon as well. If you picked up the booster 0.8, the final dungeon has fewer spike traps and is an easier journey overall. But if you manage to get the booster 2.0, the final dungeon becomes a nightmare of precise jumping and dangerous boosting, where other games might adjust difficulty by tweaking numbers, such as enemy HP or attack, your weapon damage, and other stats. Cave Story's final dungeon literally changes based on how well you've performed so far. If you saved Curly and ignored the professor in this scene, you'll also discover the game's hardest area, a second final dungeon. If you thought the game was already hard, well... It's pretty fortunate for us that the plantation is a wide open area with plenty of space for us to boost around and practice aerial movement. It's almost like the area was designed to get you very used to boosting before the final stretch of the game. Hmm... This game also has a ton of secrets. Secret weapons, secret upgrades, secret second final dungeons, and secret true ending final bosses. Large parts of the game are hidden behind the decisions that you make during the first hours of the game, and the consequences of your choices are never immediately apparent. This makes the story progress in whichever way you feel natural, because you can trace the cause and effect to each choice you make. Remember how you stole this old man's polar star at the very beginning of the game, you jerk? You can give it back to him, and be rewarded with a secret, more powerful weapon. It's things like this that are more than just fetch quests that really give the game its tone and mechanical depth. It's an incredibly simple way to show the player that their choices actually matter. Whether you escaped with Kazuma for the bad ending, struggled through and got the normal ending, or went the full mile and defeated the secret final dungeon and secret final boss. Even still, the game is fairly short, just a few hours, but because of the amount of secrets, different weapons, and two separate ending dungeons, it has great replay value. As we saw before, each level is used with maximum efficiency, and the value that you get out of a zone like Egg Corridor is staggering. And when you're sent on a fetch quest to fetch three items and make a bomb, it doesn't feel like a fetch quest because it's necessary to advance your story. It's the only way for you to free Kazuma and subsequently get off the island. In this game, there is no wasted space, no artificial difficulty, no drawn out zones with nothing to see. The gameplay is merely a vehicle to tell the story, and when the story ends, so does the game. It's rare to see this level of synchronicity between gameplay and story. For example, the Metroidvania-style Castlevania games have long stretches of gameplay, with relatively little story progression, and the story mostly takes a backseat to you just exploring and killing things anyway. 
Because of this, sometimes those games can make you feel like your actions don't matter, which is never a feeling that a game should try to give a player. Every choice in Cave Story has weight, every action has a consequence, and gameplay and story are inseparable because they're two sides of the same coin. The game is exactly as long as it needs to be and no longer. It's the perfect length for the story it's telling. And that's really all I wanted to say about Cave Story. I mean, we could go even deeper into the analysis, but we'll stop here for now. So whether you're new to the genre or a seasoned fanatic, Cave Story will teach you its ins and outs by letting you explore and discover on your own. Whatever difficulty path you end up choosing, keep an eye out for some of the subtle ways the developer is trying to communicate with you. If he could say one thing to you, it would probably be... Cave Story has masterful game design.